we're glad to be sharing the ministry of Redemption Church with you. Now join us as we receive the Word of God. Never met a match I couldn't handle. Get ready for a battle, cause you know. to his family and his family is called the church. church it is such a good thing to be a part of his family and it is the church of the living God today in the third week of this series I want you to know that you were created to become like Christ you were created to become like Christ we humans are always in the state of becoming Right now, what are you trying to become, right? Become healthy. You're like watching what you're eating, right? You might be getting up an hour early to go do some pushing of weights around, right? Just to become healthy. Well, or maybe you're trying to become wealthy, and so you're like minding what you're, you're spending, and maybe you're, you're thinking about investing, all right? Maybe you're looking uh, to get a, a better job or to get a promotion, Maybe you're trying to become educated. So maybe you're in the middle of a semester. And if you are, my heart goes out to you. I remember what that was like. Oh, and thank you for tuning in. Thank you, thank you for taking a moment to, to come to church, even though you're in the middle of all this. All right. Maybe you're trying to become spiritual. Right? Maybe you're reading your Bible. Maybe you're worshiping. Maybe you came to church tonight. Maybe you're tuning in right now because you are trying to become something. You are trying to become spiritual. Maybe you're trying to become a, a business owner or an entrepreneur and you've got this plan, you've got this dream and you're, you're going for it and it is one of the scariest things you've ever done, but you're doing it. Way to go. You're trying to become something. Maybe you're trying to just become happy. There's some people, they're just trying to be happy. They're out. Why are they walking? They're, well, already in shape. Where, where they're walking, they're just trying to be happy. They're like looking around at the birds and the, and the, and the butterflies and they go, oh man, I feel a little better. And may, some people are just trying to be happy. Some people are trying to become married or maybe to become a parent. And these are beautiful things. Yeah. You are trying to become something right now, but are you aware of it? Are you really aware of what it is that you're trying to become. Some people want to become more like a successful celebrity movie star. I want you to picture in your head, everybody, picture at the, we're going to focus our thought. We're going to try to picture a movie star. Everybody get it? Got it? Got that, that movie star yet? I, I think we were all thinking this one on the screen, right? That one? Did we all think that one? Mm. <laughs> I sure wish we could all be wildly successful like the, the Fresh Prince here, right? <clears throat> Wealthy, popular like this movie star. And we often dream of becoming like someone, a lot like this guy, or, or you could fill in the blank with a lot of other people. But we often find out, like we did exactly one week ago, that the icon we seek to emulate is not as perfect as we originally Thought. We all know what happened, right? I think we have a picture of that, don't we? Yeah, there it is, right? No one's heard about this, right? I think it didn't make any news, right? It's like all people have talked about. So many people grew up wanting to be like Will Smith, and then suddenly only to find out Will Smith's broken like the rest of us. Will Smith needs help like the rest of us. Will Smith needs, needs uh, one of those talks with his grannies out on the front porch, you know, where she's like telling him how life works. We all need that. Some heroes can mess up so badly that we scoff at the notion of ever having held them in high esteem. And I would tell you, don't do that. Don't do that. The whole world has done that to Will Smith. Don't do that. People mess up. People mess up. Raise your hand if you ever messed up. All right, hands down. People raise your hand if you messed up this week. All right, hands down. Anybody mess up today? Right? We, we mess up. We mess up. 
my gosh. So don't scoff at this guy. In fact, Lord, help Will Smith. Help his family. Help Chris Rock. Help our world. Help us because we are all broken people in need of God. What, are, what you are becoming has everything to do with your purpose. What are you born for? You were born for this. God built growth inside of you. You are meant to grow up. You are meant to grow in skill. You are meant to grow in maturity. You are meant to grow in so many ways. Are you aware of how you are growing? You can grow in positive ways, but you can also grow in negative ways. Now, we will come back to this thought, but first, an important question, really important question. Here it is. I want you to think about it. Why did Jesus come to earth? I want you to get that thought in your head, everybody. Why did Jesus come to earth? Get that answer in your head. Why did he come? He came to earth. Why did he come from heaven to earth? Why? Why? Your answer to this question is important. And I want to just warn you, Christians often get this answer wrong. We often get this answer wrong. This one feels like, oh, this one's easy. This is like one of those Sunday school answers, right? Mom, I know. Pick me, pick me. This one I know. I know. I know this one. If you ask me about 1 Samuel, I won't know at all. If you'll ask me about the book of Nahum, I will argue that it's not even in the Old Testament. I don't know that, where that book is. But this one I know. It feels like one of those Sunday school questions. But I got to warn you, it, things can be deceiving. You, you might have the wrong answer to this very important question. Why did Jesus come to earth? Well, let me just, we'll just jump into it. Here we go. No one get angry. But listen, most Christians say, Jesus Christ came to earth to save us. Right? Maybe some of y'all were thinking that answer. Don't feel bad. Don't feel bad. This sounds like the correct answer, but I want to tell you today, it's not quite the right answer. It's not quite the right answer. The reason why this uh, is not the correct answer is because it makes Jesus a plan B. Everyone say plan B. I want to tell you Jesus is not a plan B. If the reason Jesus came to earth was because we messed up and he has to bail us out, then that makes Jesus a plan B. Do you understand that? Look, if Jesus came to earth to save man, it must be that man was plan A. Like Adam and Eve were plan A. But they failed, so now, oh, look around. Oh, Jesus, get in there. And now we got a plan B, all right? If the reason Jesus came to earth was to save man, then it means Jesus came to earth as a response and never the primary plan. And I want to tell you that's not true. He is not plan B. He has always been the primary plan Numero uno, plan A. All right, y'all with me so far? All right. Ooh, good. Jesus saves, right? Absolutely, 100%. That's the right answer. Jesus saves. If he did not come to earth, we would all be lost. All of that's true. This is true. Yet I would tell you that Jesus would have still come to earth even if man had never sinned, even if man had never needed saving from our stupid choices, I would tell you Jesus Christ would have still come to earth because Jesus is plan A. I'm telling you, no matter what Adam and Eve did with that piece of fruit, God was going to incarnate to come down and be with us. Maybe that's something for you to think about. Jesus is not a response to a failed plan A. Jesus is the plan A. Jesus is not secondary. He is primary. Can we think of any scripture that preaches Christ as a plan A? If you're going to come out and just boldly like turn over the apple cart, you better have some scripture. So let's, let's have some. We got Romans chapter 8 verse 29 from the Living Bible. It says, from the very beginning. Everybody said the very beginning. God decided that those who came to him and all along he knew who would, should become like his 
son so that his son would be the second, right? Second choice so that the son would be the plan B. No, no, that the son would be first with many brothers. From the beginning, God decided that we should become like his son, Jesus. Not from the moment they ate the fruit and sinned. No, from the beginning. Very good. Jesus is the first. He's not second. He's not third. He is plan A. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 in the message says this. We look at this son and we see God's original purpose in everything created. The, the original purpose. The first purpose that God had in his mind was not Adam and Eve. The first purpose in his mind was not a beautiful garden. The first purpose in his mind is who? Jesus, the son. The first man was Adam, but God's original purpose is not found in Adam. God's original purpose is found in Jesus Christ. Someone say amen if you agree with that. All right, that's good. We we got a few people agreeing. That's we're good so far. We're good so far. I want to tell you what a prototype is. Do you know what a prototype is? A prototype is an original model on which something is patterned. Does that make sense? So before they manufacture anything, before they manufacture the Nintendo Switch that you have in your hand and you play way too many hours. I'm looking at somebody. I'm looking at somebody, I don't know who I'm looking, but they play way too many hours on that Nintendo Switch. Now, they bought a model of that Nintendo Switch, but that Nintendo Switch was not the original prototype, Ricky. That original, that that Nintendo Switch that you have is patterned after one they created in a lab that they went through lots of testing on, and they, they went through all works, and then they decided, this is exactly what we want a Nintendo Switch to be like, and you don't have that Nintendo Switch, you have a pattern of that one. They put it on an assembly line, and it came out, your car is like that, your computer is like that, all the things that that you are so excited about, that phone that you can't wait to buy, it's not even the original, it's not the prototype, it's just a copy of a copy of a copy of the original. Are you with me so far? A prototype is the original on which something is patterned. Adam is not the prototype. Adam is the first man, right? But we are not patterned after Adam and Eve. He is not the prototype. Who is the prototype? Who do you think I'm going to say? Oh, you're good. Sunday school taught you well. In Sunday school, like 90% of the answers were Jesus, right? That's right. Jesus is the prototype that we are all patterned after. And I'm going to share one of my favorite verses that show this. Romans chapter 5 verse 14. This is one if you have a highlighter or a pen or something, you you mark this one in your in your in your uh Bible or even bookmark it on on Bible Gateway or U version whatever you're using. Romans chapter 5 verse 14. Look closely at this. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not sin by breaking a command Pay attention. As did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. Adam sinned, right? But here is where where it says this. Adam is a pattern of the one to come. What is it called when you pattern something after the original? It's called a prototype called a prototype. Adam is patterned after the one that is to come. The one to come is the prototype model, and Jesus is that one to come. Jesus is that one to come. Who is is Adam patterned after? He is patterned after Christ. He is not the prototype. He is not the original. He is the pattern. Raise your hand if you're patterned. We're all patterned after Christ. Right. In Genesis 1, God created man. Is that right? 
It says God created man in his image and after his likeness. Say image. Say likeness. So I've got, I've got this image and I got likeness and I'm going to create it after this. What is this? This is the prototype. I'm going to create it after. I want it to look just like this. I want it to act just like this. I want it to speak and think just like God himself, his own likeness and image. God's image that we were patterned after is Jesus Christ. In fact, Colossians 1.15 literally says Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the image. We are made after the image of God. Well, what is that image? It is Jesus Christ. You want to know what God looks like? It looks like Jesus. You want to know what God talks like? He talks just like Jesus. You want to know how God responds to sinners? Some people think he throws lightning bolts. No, he does he responds just like Jesus does where he gets down on the ground and he writes in dirt and he defends the woman that was caught in adultery. He goes and dies on the cross for the sinner. That is the image of God. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. He is the image. He is the prototype. Here is what I think is really essential. Get this. Jesus is what it means to be human. Think about this. Because we usually talk about the deity of Christ, and that's all true. Boom, that's all true, but that's another Bible study. Jesus is not only God, but he's also human. If Jesus is plan A, if he is the prototype and the purpose for all creation, I want to tell you Jesus is the perfect model of humanity. Jesus is what it means to be human. If you want to get your humanity right, you're going to look like Jesus. Jesus does not just save you from sin. Jesus redeems and he restores you, redeems and restores you back to what? Your original purpose. Remember, Jesus is the, the son is the original purpose of God. When you are redeemed and you're restored, you are restored back. I would, I would like to call it to your factory settings. Anybody ever have to set their computer back to their factory settings? I got a virus once. It was all over my computer. So I had to wipe the whole thing, reboot it from the very beginning, and it's back to its factory settings. Sin is a lot like a virus. And you, God doesn't just want to take you back before your last sin. He wants to take you all the way back to your original purpose in creation. And that is found in nobody else but Jesus Christ. Your original purpose. I want to tell you, addiction is not your original purpose. If you are suffering with an addiction, whatever that addiction is, it could be online, inappropriate pictures. It could be uh, a, a drugs or alcohol. It could be that you spend too much time on Facebook. Whatever your addiction is, that is not your original purpose. That is not your design. Hatred is is not your design. If you've got racism in your heart, that is not how you were originally intended to live. If you've got bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart, you need to go back to the factory settings. You need to have Jesus Christ reboot you back to your original design. I would tell you that death is not your design, and I'm really glad about that one. Death is not your design. One day, if they bury you and they put you in the ground, Jesus says that's not how they were intended to be and he's going to call you up out of the grave because you were intended to live. We could go on. Greed is not your design. You were never intended. That is not your original purpose to be greedy. That was not it. God has your original purpose and it is found in Jesus Christ. The original purpose for all things is the Son, Jesus Christ. Here is, here is what you were born for. 
You were created to become like Christ, the original design and purpose. What are you trying to become today? What is it? Are you really trying to become like Christ? I would tell you today, if you shift that from whatever you think you're trying to become, if you shift it to, I want to become a Christian. I don't want to just become a businessman. I want to become a Christian businessman. I want to be a Christian. I want to be a businessman that doesn't cheat people and doesn't cuss people out when they mess up and make them feel worthless. I want to be a Christian business man. I don't want to just be a good mom and dad. I want to be a Christian good mom and dad. You understand that? I want I don't want to just be fill in the blank. I want to be this thing as a Christian, as one that is following after Christ that looks, talks, acts and thinks like Jesus Christ. You're selling yourself short if you only think you're you're created to become wealthy. Healthy, popular. Oh, become all those things. But become them like Christ would become them. Become them as a Christian, one who follows after Jesus. Jesus is God come to earth. But here's what we're not saying. We're not saying that you become a God. You're going to become like Jesus, right? That's your purpose. But that doesn't mean you become a God. Can everybody say amen? Uh, Not to become a God. You're not a God. Look at somebody and say, you're not a God. Sorry, I love you. I love you. But you can't even find your socks when you're trying to get ready in the morning. You're like, mom, where are my socks? God knows where his socks are. You, sir, are not God. Is that all right? There are some people who come up with some weird beliefs. Anybody been around some weird beliefs? Oh, man. There are some humanistic beliefs that teach you that you can become your own God. You don't have to go too far from this. I mean, you go to Barnes and Noble, you will find these books. They're humanistic and they say, you know, just look in yourself. All the answers are in you. You are the answer. You are the answer to all your problems. What does that mean? That means that you're a God. That's what they're, that's exactly what they're saying. And they will not be shy about it. Humanism will will refer to you as your own higher power. They will do that. I want to tell you, you are no God. If you were God, you would have solved your problems by now. I want to tell you, I am not God. I have not figured out how to solve my problems. I remember one of my, one of my role models in life had a, had a saying. He said this, there's two things to remember, son. Here they are. Two things. Can you handle two things? Here they are. Here they are. Number one, there is a God. You need to know that. All right, sir, I got it. Number two is, you are not him. You need to know that there is a God, and you need to know that you are not God. You are not God in any attempt to become God. That's just foolish. It's foolish. Have we seen such a foolish plan uh, before where someone tried to become God? Have we seen it? Have we seen it in the Bible? Have we maybe seen it in Genesis chapter 3? Let's bring that up on screen. Genesis chapter 3, verse 4. The serpent told the woman, you won't die. God knows that the moment you eat from that tree, you'll see what's really going on. You'll be just like God, knowing everything, ranging all the way from good to evil. Right there in the beginning of your Bible. Genesis chapter 3. In fact, the original fall of man, it is all centered around trying to become God. Don't do it. Don't do it. This attempt to be God is what has gotten us in all of our messes. Every mess that you get in is when you think you know what's best. When you think you know what wisdom is. When you think you know the difference between right and wrong. Nope. God knows that. We need to look to God. When you're attempting to become a God, you're panning yourself After Satan and not after Christ. It is Satan who in Isaiah 14 and 14 says, I will ascend up to the throne. I will ascend up to the highest heaven and I will be like the most high. If you are trying to make yourself God, you are nothing like Jesus. You are everything like the devil. Not Christ, but the anti-Christ. Jesus is God. 
But you aren't supposed to become God. Here's what you're supposed to become. Godly. Somebody say godly. Jesus is God. I believe that's so strong. I love to talk about it. Yet at his baptism, the voice from heaven does not say, yo, guys, this is God. You know what I'm talking? Jesus is buried in the water. He's baptized. Uh, John the Baptist buries him in the water, baptizes him. Keep saying bury. Sorry, I'm symbolizing, talking symbols. He's baptized and a voice rings out. But the voice doesn't say, look, guys, it's God. Right? No, the father says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's Matthew 3 and 17. God is not saying, this is what it looks like to be God. You see that? Although Jesus is God. He's not saying, this is what it looks like to be God, but rather, this is what it looks like to be human. Like, this is what you were always intended to look like. This is how you were always intended to act. This is how you were always intended to respond. This is what it is the original purpose for humanity. It's right here. It's my beloved son, and I am well pleased in him. The father is saying, be like my earthly son. Be like Christ. As you become like the man, Christ Jesus, you will fulfill your God-given purpose. We are to become godly, but never become a god. We are to become the perfect design for humanity, the very image and likeness of God. And remind you, God didn't just dream this up last week. He didn't just start working this in your life a month ago. It was his intention. From the very beginning. And how many knows he's never given up? Aren't you glad he's never quit? I've fallen so short of the design, but he's still working on me. I remember a song they sung in Sunday school. Maybe you know it. Pardon me, Jeff, as I remind everybody. It goes, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth, and Jupiter and Mars. Oh, how patient he must be, because he's still working on me. Now, y'all listen, because I talk to people all the time that say, God hates me, God's mad at me, God's done with me. Are you kidding? <laughs> Read your Bible. <laughs> he is so patient. He so loves you that he is still trying to fix you and work on you and heal you and redeem you and restore you. Oh, how patient he must be because he's still working on me. I want to tell you, you will never find your God-given purpose until you believe the following. Here it is. Listen to this. Who you are is greater than what you do. Receive this for a moment. Who you are is greater than what you do. I want to tell you, your character is more important than your job. Your virtue is more important than your career. Your values are more important than your desires. Your wisdom is more important than your accomplishments and awards. Are you spending more time thinking about what you will do or who you are? Are you thinking more time, are you spending more time thinking about what you're going to do, what you have done, what you're doing, and what you will do? Is that where you are? Because that's not where God is focused on you. Are you focusing on the external? That's what you do. That's the external rather than the internal. And what's on the internal is eternal. Are you focusing on these things? God wants to change who you are. He wants you to be born again. I want to tell you that there's a wonderful place over here, right, right next to us. They, they, they help people with addiction over there. It's really wonderful. But I want to tell you one place they fall short. They tell you once an addict, always an addict. 
you're always going to be this way. That, that bottom line, that's the best they got to really offer to people. Jesus has so much more than that. He wants to change not just what you do. He wants to change who you are. He wants to, not, he wants to take away the destructive habits But even more than that, he wants to clean you up inside so you never want to do those things again. You don't ever want to be an abusive husband again because you have learned to be a person of love. What is that? That is God doing more than changing what you do. That's God changing who you are. And Jesus looks at a man and he says, listen, you're doing a lot of cool stuff. You're a Pharisee. You're well thought of. You can quote all the scripture. You're religious, but you need to be born again. He looks at that person and says, God wants to change who you are. If you're in this place today, I want to tell you who you are is so much more important than what you do. And God wants to change who you are. How does he want to change it? He wants to turn you into Jesus. He wants to turn you into his son that he's well pleased. He wants to turn you into his beloved daughter that he loves so dearly. He wants to change who you are. And then once you have a changed heart, the Bible says guard your heart because everything you do flows out of it. So God changes your heart. And if he can change your heart, he can change what you do. Oh, change me, oh God. Change this heart of mine. Change this mind of mine. And then, Lord, let the change flow out in the way I speak, the things I do, the places I go. Oh, Lord. I love to pray with people in this altar. But can I tell you, most of the prayers in this altar are about what we will do or what we have done. That's like most of the prayers in this altar. I love you coming to the altar. If that's what you need to pray about today, you come right to this altar with it. We'll pray about it, okay? Right? It usually looks like this. Pastor Chris, I need wisdom. I need to know what to do. Or Pastor Chris, can God forgive me? I've done this thing, All right? It's focusing on what we do, right? But what, what is more important than what you do? What is more important than what you do? It's who you are. We need to have our prayers directed towards who we are. There's a wonderful prayer in the Bible. It says, search me, O God, and know my thoughts. Try me and cleanse me. How about this one? Change my heart, O God. What is that? That's a prayer we all need to pray. We need that prayer more and more. Change who I am, Lord. Change who I am. Make that a part of your repentance prayer. Sure, repent of the sin you've done, but also, God, change who I am. Change who I am. Make me a person that loves so I don't steal anymore. Make me a person that loves so I don't cuss at people anymore. You are created to be a brand new who. You're created to become like Christ. Do you believe that today? I want to teach you this. All of the whys of life have one godly answer. Anybody ever ask why? None of y'all, but raise your hand if you ask why. God, why? Why God? Why? Why? We, we ask that. I want to I answer all of your whys at one time. And you might like it. You probably won't. But here you go. It's what I got. The answer to all of your whys is this. To make you more like Christ. Please consider it. The answer to your why right now, whatever that why is, hold it in your heart, look at it, investigate it. Might be answer B, so that you will become more like the image of his dear son, Jesus Christ. Why am I lonely? Why am I lonely? Jesus Christ was lonely. Jesus Christ was lonely. There was a time where he needed someone to just stay up and watch him pray. And they couldn't even do that. He was all alone. At the worst time in his life, he was all alone. Why am I lonely? Can I suggest to you that the the reason why is so that you can go through this and become more like Jesus Christ. 
Why am I experiencing disappointment? Jesus experienced disappointment. Jesus taught, turned around, and his disciples didn't get it. All the time. Jesus feeds the multitude. And the multitude doesn't worship God. Instead, they're like, hey, you got any more of that bread? You got any more of that bread, man? That's what they did. Don't you realize how disappointing that was? That was so disappointing. Jesus looks at Peter. He has this weird conversation with Peter. He says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, you know I love you. And this repeats three times. You know this story? You don't know half of it because you have to look into the Greek to really understand it. I'll explain it to you real quick. Pay attention. Jesus says, do you love me unconditionally? Agape. You agape me? And Peter in the Greek says, Jesus, you know I love you like a brother. Phileo. You know I phileo you. And Jesus again says, Peter, do you agape me? Will you love me in a way that you will do anything for me unconditionally? Even if you don't understand what's going on, will you continue to love me? And Peter says, well, you know I love you like a brother, phileo. And then the third time, Jesus says, Peter, will you love me like a brother? Will you phileo me? Peter is distressed. And he says, You know I will phileo you. What's happening there? Jesus is asking, will you do this for me? And Peter isn't ready to climb up and do that for the Lord. This is his own disciple. This is the one he gave the the keys to the kingdom to. This is the one he loves. This is his, one of his best friends ever. You know how disappointing it is to want somebody to love you and they can't love you enough? Jesus knows exactly how that feels. Maybe the reason you're going through that is so that you can learn what it's like to be more like Christ. You can't be like Christ if you don't go through this stuff. Well, how about this one? Why am I afflicted? Why are people hurting me? Why are people turning their back on me? Why are people betraying me? Jesus was afflicted, Jesus was tortured, Jesus was betrayed. And going through these things, that is actually what makes us like Christ. Finding a hundred dollars on the ground and picking up going, Oh, God really loves me today. That doesn't make you like Jesus. Looking someone in the face and loving them as they curse you. That's what makes you like Jesus. We're created to become like Jesus. And do we really know what that means? That doesn't mean you wear a t-shirt that says, what would Jesus do? It doesn't mean you got a bumper sticker. It doesn't mean that you're blasting Christian tunes in the car. It doesn't mean that you've got, you know, a bracelet on that, that, that tells people that you're a Christian. No, becoming like Christ is the cross. Becoming like Christ is reaching out to the leper. Becoming like Christ. Christ is serving people. All of the whys you ask God share this one answer to make you more like Christ. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 in the New Century Version. It says in your lives you must think and act like Christ. Your thought process. What you do. Needs to become like Christ. Are your thoughts like Christ? Do you act like Christ? Do your hands do the things that Christ did? Or do your hands hurt people? Do your hands abuse people? Do your hands steal from people? What do your hands do? You're called to think and act like Christ. God is not going to stop working on you. Until every thought and every action becomes like Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, well-known passage, Paul gives us a list of Jesus qualities 
we are intended to have. And Paul calls these the fruit of the Spirit. We'll throw it up here. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Verse 23, gentleness and self-control. Does this list perfectly describe Jesus in every way, doesn't it? Oh, that's Jesus. It's clear to see. Does this list describe you? Does this list describe you as a husband or a wife? Does this list describe you as a mom or a dad? Does this list describe you as a Christian? Does this list describe you as a neighbor? Does this list describe you as a coworker? Does this list describe you as a boss? All the areas of your life, you are supposed to look like this because this is what Jesus Christ looks like. God will not stop working on you until this list describes you. So how does God bring love? We need love, right? That's, that's that first one, right? Joy and peace, right? How does God do that? How does he bring it into our lives? And this question brings a surprising answer. The answer is this. Negative force equals positive gain. In the gym, in order to gain positive muscle mass, you must experience negative force, and it actually does negative things. It tears down your muscles. To become strong, you must go through weakness. The things that tear us also build us. Now, here's what we want God to do. Let me tell you exactly what we want God to do. We want God to zap us. If God could just have his finger and go, Zap, right? And he zaps me with everything I need. All the deficiencies I've got. He's like, heavenly zap from above. God's bug zapper. Somehow it's just, we're just buzzing around suddenly. Bump, now we get it, right? We would gladly take a pill if it would endue us with the power we crave. Just take this pill and now you love, right? Or how about... For just three easy payments of $19.99. Oh, I would pay gladly. Or even just purchase a book. If you'll just purchase this book and read it, then you'll learn all the qualities to become like Christ. Man, we would do it in a second if it would just add the missing ingredient. I want to tell you, God does not work that way. His design is not implemented that way. That is not his original purpose for you. It is not. God puts you in the opposite position to gain what you need. Negative force brings positive gain. He actually takes you in the opposite position to gain what you need. How does God build love in you? Do you know how God builds love in you? Does God put you around loving people and by osmosis you learn how to love? Is that it? That's not it. Nope. God puts you around difficult people. He sticks you in tight places with unlovely people. God uses nasty comments and unkind looks as if they were heavenly sandpaper to knock off your rough edges. When you learn to love those that don't love you, then you have learned to love like Jesus. Then you have become like Christ. Some of you are around unloving people. Why am I around these people? To learn love. Learn love. Show love. How does God build joy in you? It would be so great if God dropped confetti balloons on us and that was all it took for us to become joyful. You're just minding your own business and suddenly it's like, ta-da! And like, there's angels like, rave party, everybody's dancing. It's, it's, you end up like, oh my goodness, I'm now joyful. Check this out. I'm so happy. Wouldn't that be so good? Wouldn't it, Jeremy? That would be so good. That was my best dance move. I hope y'all are impressed. I want to tell you that many people confuse joy with happiness. Happiness is about happenings. Happiness is based on circumstance. If the right circumstances happen, you become happy. If the right things happen, you become happy. That is not what joy is. That's not joy. God builds joy. Through the negative force of grief. 
It is here that God turns sorrow into joyful dancing. That's what Psalm 30 and 11 says. Somehow God uses grief. God uses tears. God uses sadness. God uses loss. And in the middle of that turmoil, you learn true joy that's not based on circumstance. And now you've got a joy that the world can't give and the world can't take away. The most joyful people are not those who have never experienced difficulty, but those who have come through trials and tribulations. Somebody say amen if it's true. Real quick, how does God build patience in you? How does he do it? Here's how he does it. Red lights and traffic jams. Welcome to Dallas, Texas Metroplex. It's where God teaches us all patience. The Department of Motor Vehicle Vehicles is one of God's instruments to teach you patience. Oh my gosh, there is one right across the street. It's, it's an awful place to go. It, if you're impatient, you cannot stand going there. I want to tell you, the doctor's waiting room is a place that builds patience. Can you stand that waiting room? It's like, what are they doing in there? They can't be that sick. Like, you'll think these awful thoughts. I am way more important than those people. They need to get me in there right now. But I would tell you that God places you in his own waiting room. And there you prayed, but you still don't get the answer. It builds patience. I want to tell you very quickly that problems build you. You need to think about your problems differently. Problems build you. Problems grow you. God is not a vending machine. God is not Amazon Prime same day delivery. Prayer to God is not, but I want an Oompa Loompa now. That's not what prayer is all about about your problems are helping you and you want to run away from your problems but it was God who let the problem come your problems are the negative forces shaping you to become more like Jesus your problem is reminding you that it is not about you Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 one of my dad's favorite verses I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I'm not the one that matters. I'm not the one the world needs to hear from. I'm not the one the world needs to see. It is Christ living in me that needs to walk in to the Starbucks, walk into the job, walk into the school, and it needs to speak. That Christ needs to speak. I no longer need to live, but Christ lives in me. What am I saying? I need to become less like Chris Lewitt and more like Jesus Christ. Oh, world, forgive us for being more like ourselves and less like Jesus Christ. Lord, we need to be more like you. It is not about you. It is about loving God, and it is about loving others exactly how Christ loves. 2 Corinthians 13, 8, 3, 18 in the New Living Translation, and the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. The Spirit of God, the Lord Jesus Christ inside of us makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Earlier we had a picture of Will Smith. We're not supposed to become like that image. Whatever image you're trying to become like, it needs to be Christ. Lord, let that be the glorious image that we're being changed into Ephesians 4.13 until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Listen to this. Attaining 
to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Becoming to the full measure of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. We're supposed to become more and more like Jesus. We become more and more like Christ until we are completely changed into His glorious image. Do you know where the word Christian came from? Do you know where the word Christian came from? It's in your Bible. It's in the city of Antioch. And the word Christian means little Christ. It means people that look and talk and act just like Jesus. Do you realize where they came up with the term Christian? It's because those people acted like Christ. They went, those people are just like Christ. And they actually meant it as a, as a diss. Those are like just little Christ running around. They're helping everybody like Christ. They're loving everybody like Christ. They're forgiving everybody like Christ. They like open their home to people like Christ. They're just like Christ. And they meant it as a, as a diss. They meant it as a dishonor against those Christians. It is the greatest honor to be like Christ. <laughs> oh, to be mentioned in, his, in a sentence with Christ is the greatest thing uh, I could ever receive. We become more and more like Christ. Every problem has a purpose. Every problem offers a choice. You're given truth. You're given, you, you get to choose what to do with that truth. You have a truth. What do you do with the truth God has given you? You, you are given trouble. What will you do with the trouble? How will you respond to the trouble? You're given a trial. In what spirit will you walk through that trial? You're given temptation. Who will you choose to serve in the temptation. Now we all deal with temptation. And you've been beat down way too much about temptation. I want to offer you this choice. When you have temptation. You are given a choice. And you beat yourself down. Just because you have the temptation. That's not God's intent at all. He has given you a place. Where you could choose to do bad. But guess what else you could choose to do. Good. And do you know what it is. To be in temptation but choose to do good, it's called victory. It's called winning. It's called being like Jesus Christ who was tempted in every way but never sinned. So stop beating yourself down because you have temptation in your life. Instead, it is a problem and there's a purpose behind it. And you can become like Christ in the middle of the temptation. That's what your problem yields. God Sometimes answers your, pro your prayer with a problem, with a temptation. He will give those to you just to help you become more like his beloved son. You were born to know and love God. You were formed for his family. Next, God wants you to grow up. Somebody say, grow up, baby. There is a difference in growing old and growing up. We all know people who are older in age, but still are immature. In fact, I would tell you that the world is full of babies who need to grow up. Describe a baby with me. How about this? Shallow, self-centered, entitled, self-reliant, right? Not, not self-reliant, just reliant. Lacks responsibility, desires instant fulfillment. Does that describe a baby? Does it also describe the world? Think about it. Our world needs to grow up. Our world is full of babies. Does this list describe Jesus? No, not in any way. Does any part of this list describe you? And that is an answer you need to get inside your heart. And I want to tell you, if you find yourself anywhere on this list, I've got three words for you. Grow, baby, grow. God wants you to grow. He wants you to grow. And he wants you to grow until you look just like Jesus Christ. There is such danger in remaining an infant. Jesus warned of this in his parable of the sower. We're drawn to a close. It says Mark 14 and 16. I'm reading the message. And some, and he's talking about people, are like the seed that lands in the gravel. When they first hear the word, they respond with great enthusiasm. But there is such shallow soil of character. That when the emotions wear off and some difficulty arrives, there is nothing to show for it. You can receive a word 
You can receive the very word of God. God can absolutely speak to you. But because you are shallow. It can't come into your life. And take root. And all you'll end up getting is some emotion. But once the emotion is gone. It all comes to nothing. I want to tell you that church needs to be much more than an emotion. The word of God needs to be much more than making you feel really good. You're supposed to be changed on the inside. Because that word has taken root in your life. We're turning off those video games right now, sons. Turn them off now. Everyone clap because the dad was a dad. Thank you. Sons, we're created to become like Christ. Jesus offers us an opportunity to grow. You are born to become like Jesus. What area of your life doesn't look like Jesus right now? That is an area you can grow. So come to this altar today and pray about that. Does anyone feel God calling them to grow today? That's been my prayer all week that you'd feel a call to grow. Does anyone... For more information about redemption, look us up online at redemption-church.com. We want to hear from you, so be sure to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, or even our anonymous question text line at 214-856-0550. Thank you for joining us, and have a blessed day.